Welcome to Giving an Answer, the show dedicated to defending the historic Christian faith. I am your host, Harold Felder, and today the topic is, Why Should Christians Care About Philosophy? And here to discuss this with me, I have Jason Reed. Jason Reed has an undergraduate degree in philosophy from Iowa State University. He has a Master's of Art in Apologetics from Southern Evangelical Sem Seminary. He is a doctoral candidate at St. Louis University, and he's professor of philosophy now at Southern Evangelical Seminary. So, Jason, did I leave out anything? No, that's very good. Okay, okay. So, I'm enjoying this because it won't be long before I have to call you Dr. Reed, huh? That's true. Um, right now I am finishing up, well, I'm starting my fourth year, actually, of graduate work in philosophy at St. Louis University, um, focusing on metaphysics and philosophical theology, and, and the plan is to have the dissertation, everything defended within the next 18 months. How did you get involved so, in, in, in philosophy? I get involved in philosophy, well, um, it's actually after I became a Christian. Um, I after was, you became a Christian? Ever, after I became a Christian. I was um, 1992, I was 22 years old, and uh, be witness to on the baseball team at Iowa State. Make a long story short, but gave my life to Jesus Christ on June 28th, 1992. Um, Dave Dervecki uh, was giving a speech on uh, the, uh, Christianity and baseball and shared the gospels there. I gave my life to him. And then like any Christian, you know, she either go into ministry or you know, go, go overseas or be a pastor. So I went back to the university and studied in, uh, I was gonna study religion. Mm -hmm. I had to take this philosophy class and uh, I wasn't all that excited about it because I figured I'm going to go in there and they're tell me I don't know the wall exists, I don't know if the <laughs> tables, you know, the tables here, that kind of stuff. Right, right. But they asked one question um, the very first day of class, and he asked me, uh, asked the course, the, the, the class, um, what does it mean for something to be good? How do you know whether or not something is good? And what's God's relationship to the good? And I was hooked. Oh, right that, that was it for you. That was it for me, and I thought, you know, these are the kind of questions that Christians ask, these are the kind of questions I'm asking, so that's how I got started in philosophy. Okay, now, I know you know the answer to this question, because mm -hmm. if you don't, then, you know, I, they need to kick you out of the school you're going to. But what is philosophy? Well, it may be a surprise, but what, the, what philosophy is, is itself a philosophical question. Maybe the best way to answer that question is to um, go over the kinds of things that philosophers ask, the kind of questions that philosophers ask. The philosopher is interested in seeking truth. The philosopher is interested in finding out um, what does it mean to be a wise person. That's what the actual word means. It's the love of wisdom to be a philosopher. And philosophy comes in different kinds, comes in different degrees. And the best way to get at um, the kind of philosophy that we're going to be discussing is to look at the three different levels of philosophy. There's one level of philosophy where um, where you're at either at the dinner room table, or you're in your dorm room, or you're at a family reunion, and you're discussing topics, you know, like, um, what is the truth? You know, is Jesus Christ the way? Um, what, should you vote Republican? Should you vote Democrat? Um, is abortion right? Is abortion wrong? At least, um, wh why, why is my um, curfew the right time? You know, things like that. Those are philosophical questions, and those are what's kind of called a table talk philosophy. And then there's a kind of philosophy that is expressed in art. And actually, I was just, as I was coming up here, I was listening to a song by Jackson Brown. I'm like, I might date myself there a little bit, but Jackson Brown has a song called Running on Empty. And what that song's about um, is about here he is, he's on this road, he doesn't know why he's on it. He doesn't know where he's going. He doesn't know how he even got on it. He doesn't know um, anybody who else can tell him why he's on this road. He looks in other people's eyes and they're just lost too. So the song Running on Empty is a song about what's called nihilism, the idea that life is meaningless and purposeless, and all he knows is that he's running, but he doesn't know where he's going to. Um, there are s plays by Samuel Beckett which um, present the same worldview. Um, there's one play where um, the curtain opens you got the actors and they're standing there looking at the um, audience and for 15 seconds they just do this. I heard about that play. And then the, and then the curtain closes. <laughs> 
And what the point of the, the play is that that's what life is. You're just kind of this vapor. You come, you go, and that's it. There's no ultimate purpose, there's no ultimate meaning. Okay, so that's, the, that's kind of philosophy ex, um, expressed in art. Then there's the third level, which is academic philosophy. That's dealing with things like metaphysics. What does it mean for something to be real? What is real? Does God exist? Do we have souls? Um, do we have minds? Do we have a free will? Are there angels? Um, is there anything beyond the space-time universe? Does something go beyond it? Um, what's the ultimate end in life? Where are we going? And uh, I guess that's the, that's the kind of thing that philosophers are after. We're after what it is, um, that what is the truth? Where are we going? Why are we here? Is there life after death? Those sorts of questions. Well, I guess you sort of already touched on it, but what is the relationship then between Christianity and philosophy? Well, uh, let me see some more about what philosophy is. Philosophy is primarily, and this is going to connect to this question, philosophy is primarily a rational enterprise. What the philosopher is doing is he's looking at these questions in light of human reason. What is that we can find out with our own human minds, without any sort of assistance, with logic and experience, what can we find out? Where is it that reason can take us? Where can we find the truth? And the connection between philosophy and Christianity, for a Christian, how is a Christian going to look at this relationship? Well, there's two different um, revelations. There's two different um, ways in which we can learn the truth about God. The one is called special revelation. That's the, that's the truth found in the scriptures. That's right. where God gives us truths that reason cannot find. Okay. There are things that we need to know as human beings that we're never going to find on our own. We're never going to find the road to heaven. We're never going to find out that we are um, sinners before a holy God. We're never going to find out about right. Jesus Christ, these right. sorts of things. So God has given us truth that we cannot find on our own. Philosophy deals with God's other revelation, general revelation, the universe, the world. And so the relationship is that basically the Christian is looking at two different worlds in which God's created, the world that's found in the scripture or the scripture and general revelation. Okay, okay. Why... Why does it seem that philosophy and Christianity butt heads all the time? Well, it's interesting you said that because when I was actually in philosophy, that's the, that's the question I kept getting asked. You know, why are you interested in philosophy? You know, you Christians shouldn't do that. That's for atheists and skeptics and et cetera. Well, that's actually a really naive position. Um, the history of philosophy is filled um, with great, great Christian philosophers. I mean, some of the greatest philosophers that ever existed were Christians. Um, St. Augustine. St. Anselm, St. Thomas Aquinas, um, the reformers, um, even living philosophers today like Alvin Plantinga and William Lane Craig and Norman Geisler. Um, I think the reason why they reject philosophy is because most of philosophy that has been, in the last hundred years has been atheistic and skeptical philosophy. And we have not taught people that um, that there's nothing to fear from philosophy. I mean, if you really want to find out the truth of what the philosopher is after, there's no reason to reject it anymore. There's a re reason to reject the pursuit of truth. So I think the reason why we reject it because Christians aren't aware of good philosophy. Okay, because it does seem that way. I mean, I, I remember that some of the earliest philosophers were Christians, mm -hmm. and it seems like it was that way for a while, and then all of a sudden they got to a point where it changed, and it started to be anti-Christian. It, it's, it's interesting that um, what happened is Christians stopped to philosophize. The reason why so many philosophers today, or in, you know, it's not so much anymore, but 10, 15, 20, 50 years ago, the reason why so many philosophers were atheistic and skeptics is because they had won the debate. Christians had removed themselves from the discussion. We had let people like David Hume, the skeptic philosopher, the Scottish skeptic philosopher, Immanuel Kant, the agnostic German philosopher, um, Charles Darwin, um, the naturalistic philosopher slash biologist, we allowed them to win. We didn't engage these philosophers. We didn't answer the skeptic. We didn't answer the agnostic. And so the fact that they won that exchange, they won that debate, Christians thought, well, if you're going to be a philosopher, you got to do what David Hume does. If you're going to be a philosopher, you got to do what Immanuel Kant does. But we don't want to do that. And so Christians kind of remove themselves from the discussion. What we're going to do, instead of engage the philosopher, instead of engaging skepticism and agnosticism, we'll just retreat and have our own Bible, you know, that's the world's kind of us versus them mentality. Don't think about those things, just preach Jesus and Jesus crucified. Wow, yeah, because that, that's one of the things that, have, that has always bothered me about 
the perception of philosophy. I mean, because when I look at it, you said that philosophy basically is the pursuit of wisdom. Mm -hmm. It's the love of wisdom, that's right. But now, if, if, if what we're doing is we're pursuing wisdom, but you also said that it was, it's what man can determine with his own reason. So is that also, just by that fact alone, it's because man, man can discover with his own reason, does that automatically lead to a role of agnosticism, agnosticism and atheism? Because you can't know God with, you know, with your own reason. You can't, if, if you can't touch it and feel it, then it doesn't exist, a lot of philosophers will say, right? Well, not anymore. They're not anymore. That, that's, called a, that's a view called logical positivism. And you hear people say, well, if I, can't, if I can't see it, hear it, taste it, touch it, then I can't believe it. The problem is that this, this philosophy, namely that if I can't see it, hear it, taste it, or touch it, is, in, is a philosophy that you can't see, hear, taste, touch, or smell. Right. Okay, so um, what was the question? The question, I I was yeah, 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 you're gonna, edit, you're gonna edit this, right? <laughs> because okay. at least it seems like if you can only know what you can see and feel, then that seems why that, that seems to be the explanation as to why Christians or you know philosophers come to the conclusion that there is no God, because they can't feel, taste, or touch Him. Right, and the, but philosophy, the good thing, philosophy isn't necessarily restricted to that. There are different kinds of philosophy. There are different philosophical arguments, and it's up to the debate to whether or not that's true. And actually, philosophers now pretty generally believe that that, that philosophy is dead. Um, that's why, I mean, now that that philosophy is dying, namely that um, it's called this, the idea that all the natural world exists, that's all we can hear, taste, touch, or smell, it's all the thing we can believe in. Because that philosophy is no longer seen to be this impenetrable, um, in, indubitable, um, infallible position, all of a sudden now God's starting to come into the picture. We have now um, what's called the Evangelical Philosophical Society. Some of the top philosophers in the world belong to the Evangelical Philosophical Society. Um, the American Philosophical Association, which is the philosophical association, I mean, that's where all, I mean, if, you're, if anybody who's anybody is a member of that, a member of that society, three presidents of, of that organization were evangelical Christians. Hmm. And how, how is this possible? It's possible now because philosophers now recognize that there can be knowledge about things that transcend the physical. I also and that heard also that, lets in God. I also heard that more and more more journals are being written about Christianity and philosophy and, and God and philosophy. That philosophy, philosophers are once again turning to this question with more of an open mind than they have in the past. Well, and, and even the, the the skeptical philosophers recognize this. We have um, there's what's called the Faith and Philosophy Journal, which is the journal for the Society of Christian Philosophers. Top journal. Some of the top guys are getting published in there. It's difficult to get your articles published in there because you've got so many good philosophers submitting papers. You have the American Catholic Philosophical Association. They have their journal and that brings in faith and reason, questions that concern the Christian as well as the philosopher. You have Philosophia Christi, um, which is the journal of the American Philosophical Society. Now there is a, I can't remember the, um, the journal, but it's an atheistic journal or a naturalistic journal. And in that journal, um, recently, there is an article written by a skeptic, atheist naturalist named Quentin Smith. And he is, he, his whole article was criticizing the skeptics. So listen, these Christians are winning. They're winning, look at their journals. They're publishing top guys. So there's, their articles are sophisticated. Their arguments are cogent. Um, they're just beating us up. We've got to get our level of play up so we can take on these guys. So even skeptics are recognizing that the Christians are winning and they need to up their game. Do you believe that also, that the Christians are winning? I believe they're winning and that they're losing. They're winning in the sense that the professional philosophers realize that this is going on. But the everyday person still thinks that most of the, Christian, most of the philosophers are skeptics. Um, a lot of the um, um, winning that the Christians are having or the theists are having in the philosophical journals isn't getting down to the college lecture. And i give you an example. Um, my sister is now a freshman at a university in the Midwest, and she's taking a psychology class. Now there are two views, at least, in psychology or philosophy of mind. There's what's called monism, and that's a be the belief that we are just brains and, and um, nervous uh, spine and a physical body. There's nothing spiritual about us. If there is, science can't treat it. 
Then there's what's called dualism, namely that there's the physical side to our humanity and that there is an immaterial slash soul, spiritual side to humanity. And the professor asked the class, um, which do you believe in monism, namely that all there is is body, you know, brains and nerve endings and cells? People raise their hand. Who believes in dualism, namely that there is a soul and there is a body? And some people raise their hands. The professor actually told the class, well, everyone believes, I mean, everyone now believes that there is no such thing as dualism. No one believes that um, all there is is, um, uh, everyone believes in monism. Name oh, yeah? Yeah. And he told that to class. And so she called me and says, is that true? I said, I don't know how she can say that. When David Chalmers, one of the leading philosophers of mine in the world, and I teach at the Australia American University, is a critic of this, this view. There is a philosopher of mind um, at Loyola University named David Yandel who's defending dualism. Richard Swinburne, professor emeritus at Oxford University, has a book called um, Evolution of Soul. Um, there's a huge debate going on in philosophy of mind, whether or not we can reduce the human person to a material body. But that doesn't get to the everyday person. So are we winning the debate? Well, yes and no. As far as the journals and the, and the, professor, the professional journals, they recognize that there is a debate going on, but still there's this control of the naturalist over the lecture, lectern, and that's what needs to change. Okay, now the average person watching the show is probably thinking to themselves, philosophy. Okay. <laughs> I know. Okay. Right. But basically, why should the average person listening to us, why should the average person care about philosophy? What does it have to do with them? The average Christian who wakes up in the morning and reads their Bible and then goes off to work and comes home and feeds the kids, why should they care about philosophy? Okay. Why should we care about philosophy? Um, there's a great quote by uh, Joseph Pieper in his book called In Defense of Philosophy. He says in that book, one of the greatest um, defenses of good, or one of the greatest weapons of goodness is philosophy. And why does he say that? Because he's, I think he's getting his cue from Paul in 2 Corinthians. Excuse me. In 2 Corinthians, Paul's talking about spiritual warfare. You know, our weapons are not of this world, you know, where our enemies are not of flesh and blood, neither are our weapons. He says, um, we demolish all arguments and every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God. The greatest attack against Christianity against Christian belief are not um, terrorists, are not um, um, liberals and activists and politics. The greatest um, enemy of the Christian faith are ideas, arguments. Why is that? Because Paul recognizes, or at least Paul's teaching, that if you're convinced by something, if you're convinced by an argument, your, your beliefs and your actions and your practices are going to follow suit. Why should Christians care about philosophy? Because philosophy is a great weapon against the enemy and it can help you in your own Christian life and your walk with your Christian life. I but it's got to be good philosophy. Right, that's, we're right. going to get to the, I suppose we're going to get to that. Right, because that's what I want to talk to you about now because I believe that, and I'm sure you will agree, that everyone is involved in philosophy. Every church is somehow involved in philosophy. What types of philosophy do you see, bad philosophy, being practiced in the church today that most people won't even realize is philosophical? Right, and the reason why they're, um, these bad ideas, these are, bad ideas are creeping, um, one of the causes is because Christians don't believe that they're engaged in philosophy. They're engaged in religion, they're engaged in Christianity, they're engaged in their church. But to say that I'm not into philosophy or I don't believe in philosophy is itself a philosophical position. And when you're unaware of philosophy, if, you're, if you don't know it's there and you don't care to study it, you're going to be defeated by it. You're going to be influenced by it. Um, it's kind of like, um, what's a good analogy? Let's say you're not prepared. You don't even realize that there's a war going on. And you don't believe in wars. You think wars are for other people. Okay? But unknowns to you that there is right outside your house is a battlefield. And right now there are bullets flying back and forth your yard. You're not ready for it. You don't even know that's there. You step out in the battlefield, what's going to happen? Walk out right in the line of fire. The, the analogy actually breaks down because the sad thing is Christians are being killed, but they don't know it. That's how the analogy is different. You know, at least in the battlefield, in the, war, the bullets, when it, pen, you know, when it hits your heart, you, you die. Sorry. But Christians are dying intellectually. Their faith is dying, and they don't know it. 
How is that possible? Well, one of the things that we see in the church is this whole separation between faith and reason. You can't prove that Christianity is true. Um, faith is personal. It's private. It's subjective. That is a non-Christian philosophy. One of the things that, I mean, I speak a lot of churches. I talk to a lot of Christians. Um, one of the things that I see as um, the, one of the bad influences of philosophy is that Christians, because they ignore philosophy, they don't realize the anti-Christian ideas that they have. The idea that Christianity is only true for me, this is the view called subjectivism, namely that why is Christianity true? Yes, everyday Christian on the street. Why is Christianity true? Well, it's true for me. me. It's true for me. How do you know Christianity is true? Because I believe it and I feel it. How do you know that Jesus Christ is the true Son of God? Because I have faith. All these sorts of answers. It wasn't until I actually had um, Mormon it's come to my door. I mean, I'm not a Mormon. Mormons came to my door. These um, uh, missionaries came to my door. And they, you know, they said, can we talk about Jesus Christ? I said, sure, go ahead. And as they started um, giving me their defense of Mormonism, you know, I let them talk for about 20, 25 minutes. And at the end of that conversation, I said, that's great. I can see you know, that you're faithful. I can see that you really believe this. I can, I can see that you're convinced that's changed your life. But my question is, why should I believe it? I see why you should believe it. Why should I believe it? And they started saying, well, um, because Joseph Smith is a, is a true prophet. And they started giving me these other line of evidence. I said, how do you know that's true, though? All this presentation you give me presupposes that it's true. How do you know that it's true? And they said, read the book, and you'll get a burning in your bosom. You'll know that it's true. They couldn't give me another answer. And then it dawned on me, that's how I witness. Now, how can I as a Christian, witness to other people saying, you know, it's true for me, you'll believe it, you'll feel it, you know that it's true. How can I, as a Christian in good conscience, witness the same way as someone who is a cult member? How has that happened? Because yeah. I bought into bad philosophy. That's another good thing because when you're talking about sub sub subjectivism and pluralism, all of these type of philosophies that are pervasive in the church, within the church, because I had a long, one lady telling me not long ago is that, you know, how can I say there's only one way to God? That's a philosophy, and that you could trace the roots of that philosophy. A lot of people don't realize that, but that philosophy comes from philosophers taught 100, 200 years ago, and then it's trickled down to the church, and this bad philosophy has infiltrated the church, and Christians don't know that it's bad philosophy that they're being you know, inspired by. Exactly, I mean, the, the, here's, here's what the church is about. We are a light to the world. We are to have a unique claim. We are trying to proclaim truth to the world. Jesus says, I am the way, and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. We are making these claims, and the church has adopted a philosophy that undermines Christianity's uniqueness, Jesus Christ's uniqueness, and our light. We are becoming part of the world instead of being a light to the world. So what has been the impact of these bad philosophical thoughts on the church? We're losing our youth yeah. in record numbers. Um, most kids today who give their life to Jesus Christ, you can look at, um, um, Ray Comfort's website. If you go and do a Google search on Ray Comfort, he's got a ministry. He's got all these statistics. Um, most out of every hundred kids that give their life to Jesus Christ, maybe one out of ten within the next three months remain faithful. It's also affecting the church in the way in which we witness. We witness to, to unbelievers in this way. Jesus will provide meaning for your life. If you're sad, if you're lonely, if you're divorced, if you're sick, come to Jesus and he'll make you better. If you're poor, he can give you money. All these sorts of things. Well, that's not what the gospel is. That's not the gospel. The gospel in the New Testament, when people witness, they proclaim Jesus and Jesus Christ crucified, and it's true. It happened. It's the only way to salvation. So how's it affecting it? We are losing our uniqueness and it's destroying our youth because the youth... Are, being, um, are asking these sorts of questions, are asking good questions, and because they're not getting good answers, they're leaving the faith. They see no reason to stay. When I was an undergraduate um, at Iowa State, non-believers gave me every reason not to be a Christian, and my Christians never could give me any reason to stay. Mm. And, and the everyday person, the, every, the, the youth are seeing this, because I tell you what, the enemies, the enemy of Christianity, the skeptics, the non-Christian philosophers are aggressive. They have websites geared towards teenagers, towards youth, towards college kids, and their whole objective is to take away the faith of young people by using bad philosophy. You mentioned an interesting thing because 
I remember, oh, I've been told, I wasn't around that long ago, mm -hmm. it was 100 years ago, but mm -hmm. when people used to minister the gospel, they used to do it, you know, differently. Now it's about what, what can Jesus give you? Mm -hmm. Whereas before, that wasn't the message. It was like, you know, you're a sinner, you need Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, now it's, you know, it's more catered toward people. So that change is a philosophical change. The four spiritual laws, that's a philosophical change from, from the times before that. You're right, the philosophical change is this. We went from believing in absolute truth to objective truth to unique truth to relativism. The idea that, well, truth is, you know, dependent upon the person, um, subjective, namely, the only way we can get you to believe, the only way that Christianity is going to become true for you is if you believe it. Is if you believe it. Actually, I was listening to a, a sermon a few weeks ago. Um, the professor, the, the pastor said this, the gospel hasn't made any difference in your life unless you've been changed by it. And that sounds good. I started thinking, now wait a minute. That's the other way around. It's like I have to incorporate the gospel in order for it to have any meaning. Mm. Right? Yeah. It's a subtle difference. It sounds good. You know, it sounds like you, um, um, you have to believe it, make it, part of yourself, uh, make it part of your own life. It's got to change you in order for it to matter to you. The fact is, is that that is a subjectivist witness. Okay. Well, Here's an objection I have for you. Okay. Faith is believing and not seeing. You talk, you're talking about all this philosophical stuff, and but faith, you just gotta believe. I mean, wh why have to reason that something is correct or something is right? It's you're calling you. You want me to believe something? Right. It's 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 um, kind of like this. It, it's it's like these faith and reason are like two balloons, let's say, and they're in a room together. The bigger reason gets, the bigger that balloon gets. What happens to the what has to happen to the balloon of faith? Well, the the, the reason balloon is going is to fill up the room, right? It's going to start taking up more space. Therefore, the bigger that reason gets, the smaller faith gets. And what that um, presupposes, the whole objection, namely that you know you asked me to reason and, and faith is uh, faith is just you know believing without seeing, that presupposes that faith and reason are in conflict. Mm. That's a presuppose that they're in conflict. Maybe if one increases, the one has to decrease, and vice versa. That's a false assumption about faith and reason. They're hand in hand. Now, um, faith deals with things that are in, you know, the most important things. Faith deals with things that we can't see. But faith and reason are compatible because they deal with different things. Faith is only as good as the object of faith. And this, we're thinking about Hebrews 11, 1, where, and following, where it says that faith you know, we have faith in things that we can't see. We only have, we even have certainty about it. The reason why faith can have certainty is because we have faith in God. The New Testament faith is believing in God when He says something. That doesn't mean we can't reason about things. That doesn't mean we can't arrive at certain conclusions. Faith and reason work hand in hand. Because actually, the more reason that we have, the more faith is required. Right, right. Right. Because when you really come to reason the conclusion that Christianity is true and Jesus Christ really is the Son of God, that requires an act of faith on my part. It doesn't negate it. It requires me to do something about it. So faith deals with the act of will. Am I gonna, what am I going to do with what my reason has told me? And reason provides that which the will deals with. Well, Jason, that's going to bring us to an end. That will end this episode of Giving an Answer. Be sure to join me again next time. And until then, goodbye and God bless.